Hello and welcome to Very British Futures, the podcast where myself and special guests look back at one of the many science fiction television series produced in Britain over the decades. Writer Nigel Neal has had a massive influence, not just on science fiction, but on popular television drama as an art. So it's a little surprising to realise that in his long career, he wrote only six original series, as opposed to single plays or adaptations. One of those is today's subject, a sitcom called Kinvig. Helping me decide whether it's an overlooked gem, a terrible misfire, or something in between, our video designer for the theatre, Tim Reed, and video editor for Cartel Productions, Charles Octoloni, the host of the Randomizer Pod, a marvellous Doctor Who podcast. So, how are you today? Oh, very well, thank you, and thank you very much for having us. We feel quite special. Uh, it's you know. like being on a grown-up podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we are kind of like scumbag college, but, you know, uh, sort of coming to you and, uh, you know. As you long know. as it ends with a giant cream eclair falling. Yeah, yeah, happy. and I, I want to smash <laughs> through the, the roof and hit someone. <laughs> uh, it's lovely to be here, Gav. Thank you for having us. And, um yeah, we've um, enjoyed listening to the episodes that we've heard of uh, Very British Futures so far. Mm. Um, particularly the Tripods one for me was a, a highlight because I have fun memories of that. And the Star Cops as well. Yeah. Um, very, very good sort of reminiscences there. And I was, I'm reading the book that came out quite recently about the production of the show. So mm -hmm. it's all coming back at once. Mm. Yeah, um, and I'm uh, been enjoying the Knights of God one. And well, I enjoyed the tripods as well. And I'm still to listen to the Star Cops one, which I will look forward to. But the Max Headroom one was a particular, uh, particularly entertaining piece. <laughs> <laughs> That's really kind. And of the Randomizer pod, which I think is really, it goes, it goes a good balance between being articulate and informative and very funny and 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 great to it's just great to listen to you to the two of you bantering where where, where did the idea for the podcast arise uh, essentially these are the conversations we were having anyway and then at some point we thought we should just record them and inflict them on the rest of humanity as well um <laughs> actually we have an episode in the pipeline with um friend of this podcast john isles um so that'll be out at some point mm. before the heat death of the universe <laughs> possibly. <laughs> digital editing speed. possibly i mean the other uh, one of the other things is that um our late friend kenny davison we were we'd been sort of talking with him about something like that and i think his death sort of spurred us on to do it it probably wouldn't have happened actually if he <laughs> if he hadn't died so thanks kenny well this way we get a word in yeah that's true because <laughs> yeah yeah i mean kenny would have just you wouldn't have got any word no so definitely the sort of conversations we always enjoyed that land randomly lurched from topic to topic and didn't have a particular format or a plan mm became the springboard to talk about Doctor Who that way with the help of that randomly generated episode mm. uh, website, randomizer.net, which is well worth a visit um, if anybody's not discovered it. Um, and you're thinking, which episode shall I watch? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we, we've enjoyed making them and uh, I think we pinned them around the new episodes of Doctor Who that have been released since we started. Um, so it tends to go into a little bit of a, a lull when there's not new Who to be talking about. But we're also making our way through the back catalogue of Red Dwarf at the moment, if anybody's interested mm. in joining us for that. Um, mostly we're just kind of laughing at remembering the jokes and being quite disturbed at how well we can quote them line for yeah, line. Yeah, it's stuff. actually very spooky. <laughs> Kinvig was a seven-part sitcom shown on ITV in 1981 about Des Kinvig, a feckless repairman living above his rundown shop with his wife Netta and dog Cuddly. Des's typical day is taken up with avoiding work and chatting nonsense with his UFO-obsessed best friend, Jim. Then one day, Miss Griffin, tall, beautiful and impatient, comes into his shop with the first of many jobs. That night, Kinvig is walking his dog when he finds a spaceship inside a free goblin-like aliens and Miss Griffin, 
now wearing a revealing outer space costume and breathlessly telling him that Dez is vital to their ongoing war with the evil insectoid Zooks. Now Dez finds his shabby life increasingly interrupted by teleportations to the spaceship and inside the planet Mercury, with only Jim aware of his unearthly adventures. It starred Tony Haygarth as Dez, with Patsy Rowlands as Netta, Prunella G as Miss Griffin, Colin Jeevans as Jim Piper, and regular guest appearances from Patrick Newell and Simon Williams. Nigel Neal was inspired to write Kinbig after being a guest at CCON, the World Science Fiction Convention, in Brighton. He quietly disliked the experience. Andy Murray, in his excellent book about Neil, Into the Unknown, quoted him as saying, It struck me that the sort of people who enjoyed that awful business were the sort of people who believe in flying saucers and ghosts and all that sort of thing, and really believe it, all of it. I just didn't like them. So I thought, all right, I'll write a series about people so silly that they could actually believe in all this nonsense. Science fiction in the UK was still enjoying the post-Star Wars boom. Kinvig was one of two ITV sci-fi comedies which came out that year, the other being Astronauts. The show was directed and produced by Les Chatfield, whose CV included sitcoms The Lovers and A Sharp Intake of Breath, and who would later produce the long-running comedy drama Watching. Kinvig is available on DVD from Network and comes with a booklet written by Andy Murray, which has been very useful whilst researching this episode. So, Charles, how would you describe the sit of this particular com? Hmm, what can I say? Um, I I basically discovered Kinvig at the time, um, and it was, uh, I basically must have watched it because it had a sci-fi element. Obviously, you know, sort of being a fan of sci-fi and fantasy in general. Um, it made an impact because for years I could remember this, uh, bits of it, but I never knew what it was until I eventually at one point I spoke to a friend of mine and mentioned it and he actually told me what it was. So that sort of came through but um really don't think it holds up uh when on a rewatch in that sense it's um it's definitely one of nigel neal's misses which is quite surprising because you know i'm a huge huge fan of neal's stuff but uh, i mean there are there are good elements which i'll go into um later on but um Initially, it was it, it is quite disappointing. Although you know, like I say, some some bits that are at least they're trying. I would say. Mm -hmm. And how about yourself, Tim? How did you uh, encounter Kinvig? Well, I mean, it's I think from the get go, it has such atmosphere that the dream sequences. <laughs> are chilling and you know janet fielding getting infected by the snake and then that scene in the forest with that machine that um, gets trapped in um, what? no no what, what, no we're not talking about kinder no oh, we're talking about kinder aren't we yeah, sorry kinder. um well it's not so much quater mass as quite a mess i think <laughs> and the um i did i tried my best with it i must be honest but i just completely struggled to to watch it and was almost not joking about the poetry appreciation chairs being necessary to, to get me to watch it through. In fact, so much so that I found myself, and this is no exaggeration, watching football for the second time in about 10 years <laughs> last night in an attempt to avoid finishing off Kinvig. Hey, hey, I, sorry to interrupt, but I can totally attest to that. He actually procrastinated for 45 <laughs> minutes watching football. And I kept saying, he's, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll wait to the, the half time. And it was it was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. <laughs> no, but, um, to be honest, by the end, however, I, I had some food for thought because I think um, 
the reading of it, which I now, having read the sleeve notes in the DVD, understand Quas Nigel Neal's intent was that this could be said to all be in Kinvik's mind mm. and sort of feverish hallucinations of beautiful space aliens um, brought on by this weird tonic that he's drinking. And especially in that scene in the final episode when he's glugging it down and getting more and more out of it, it becomes pretty clear that there's a reading of the series where this is kind of all one man's fantasy rather than mm. some very weird, lumpy, quite incoherent space drama. And um, I think the first impressions were very poor. I barely kind of chuckled at all throughout the first episode. I think I got kind of laugh at the moment where it had a, a good comedy cut from he tells his UFO buddy um, what's happened to him. And then it cuts to him telling his wife, get a glass of water, please. Terry's fainted. That was the sort of only chuckle literally in the first mm. episode. The, to be honest, um, I'm glad I've watched it. I, I think it is astonishingly unfunny and Nigel Neal's kind of great sort of reputation is utterly sullied in my mind now. I have to go back and find some of his more his highlights to watch again, restore my faith in the man. I think it's quite interesting because Nigel Neal has never demonstrated a way of comedy. You know, I mean, if you look at his body of work, there's not any real humour in there. You know, there's the odd maybe a little bit, but he mm. doesn't have much humour, I would say, personally. Either. To um, me, I, th I think he does use comic relief quite a bit in uh, in some of his dramas. I think he's quite good. He's got quite a good, usually, ear for dialogue. Mm. And yeah. Yeah. I would, a, I would agree in, there. In, in, Especially like, in some of his TV plays, I mean, yeah. certain things like in Quatermass with the the mm. line, it well Quatermass in the pit is the bit with the the owner of the barium drill who comes ah, to help yeah. them, yeah. and uh, he says that bit. Oh, I, I did a job like this last week, secret job like. Oh, and, yeah. and Breen says, "Well, I'm glad you don't oh, talk yeah. about it." Yeah, and yeah. so he's I think he's quite good at that kind of. Little, yeah, sort of... but this wasn't as subtle, let's say, you know, it, it was all overt and it, it just wasn't particularly funny. Mm. I mean, I don't know, the characters, I mean, like, Tony Haygarth is playing it like he's asleep through most <laughs> of it, because, which is ironic, because Tony Haygarth's actually quite good, generally, mm. but I just find him, he, he, he has no motivation but again that could be the character maybe that's what he was trying to do you know the character is just in a rut just completely what's the point you that's know it's the danger though of playing somebody who's down downplayed yeah. and uh, it just sucks all the energy out yeah. of the character yeah the genuinely does I th yeah I think, I think, um, so i think that, i think that is a, a problem with with kinvig i would agree there definitely that um because Kinvig is such, like you say, he's very passive. He's a man who lets mm -hmm. things happen to him yeah. all through his life. So there's not much drive him, and the things that do drive him end up being incredibly contrived. Nothing yeah. seems to happen, seems to arise naturally out yeah. of the plots. Really, you have to keep make the plot keeps making these big leaps sort of every episode, just to kind of keep things moving along. Yeah, it sort of hits a bit of a stride, I think, in the sort of latter few, where there's almost a kind of recurring joke that whatever they get up to ends up kind of compromising what Miss Griffin is doing at the time. Mm. And um, mm. So there's a kind of, it sort of begins to almost find its feet there, I think, just before just in time to, to finish, of course, with, with the seven episodes. <laughs> yeah. But the the sleeve notes actually made a lot of sense to me when I read that Neil had written these characters as caricatures of the kind of sci-fi mm -hmm. nerds who believed in the UFOs and, and so on. And actually mm -hmm. that made a lot of sense of it to me. And I, again, I think um, it is observed in the sleeve notes that he doesn't like his characters, which mm -hmm. makes it very, very difficult for you to warm to them as a viewer. Yeah. I think also it's interesting because, like I say, he's he's equated sci-fi fans with UFO, conspiracy nuts. And to be honest, I've 
I can't think of any sci-fi fan I've ever met that believes or is a conspiracy mm. nut or a UFO spot or anything like that. So he's had like one negative experience and basically thrown everybody under the bus. The damage mm. to the world from <laughs> being cornered by one particular narrative. Yeah, yeah, probably. But I get the impression, and I could be completely wrong on this, but as you know, he brought ITV back after the strike with quite a mass conclusion. That was mm-hmm. on the first night. And I get the impression that it was like a Markham and Wise, uh, like they had the golden handcuffs, they moved to ITV. Bruce Forsyth as well got whatever show that they, they were going to do. And then they were given a project or they were given the opportunity to do what they wanted. And I get the feeling that he'd done this for ITV and everything, and they basically said, whatever you've got, we'll do it. And Ken Vig came along. And six months later, mm. they said, no, not that. I could be wrong, <laughs> but it's the sort of impression uh, I, I get. I don't think it was kind of, I think it was more a case that he'd been working on Quatermass, the fourth Quatermass mm. for the BBC, and then the BBC changed their minds and said, yeah. we don't want it anymore. Yeah. And uh, and then he took it to ITV. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I think because of his reputation, he came at the right moment to say, oh, mm. I want to do a sci-fi comedy. And then yeah. he said, oh, that sounds good. And it's like, well, they probably wouldn't say the word zeitgeist, but... Uh, they probably said, oh, yeah, and you're Nigel Neal, you're the yeah. space guy, which probably riled him up. And then he, it was a result, because apparently when the tapes, one of the reasons it didn't it didn't get a, a scheduled, one of the prestigious scheduled across the network kind of slots, it was more distributed. Everyone showed it at a different time in different regions. There was a slight element that nobody had faith in it. Well, well once they saw the episode. Yeah, well, understandably. It's interesting as well because uh, his hatred for the BBC really does come out. Um, it's so subtle, in, though. You the, can miss it. <laughs> <laughs> in the council, you know, the BBC. Because and, the, um, the episode like the... that starts with the BBC sign burning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, very, it's very much, you know, this is hell. <laughs> That's quite, quite a good sequence, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to be. I want to sort of point out some positives for sure. That um, I enjoyed some of the effects shots. Um, there mm-hmm. was, some of them were kind of, kind of quite dated, but there were some that really stood up as well. The, yeah. the kind of mercury model or graphic that mm-hmm. he used whenever he zapped over to mercury was kind of mm-hmm. pleasant. The um, one of the UFO lifting off shots in yeah. the first episode was pretty good. Um, I think the interior design of the sort of sci-fi <laughs> areas. I mean, at sort of at one point, I think I said um, the interior of Mercury looked like the restaurant at the end of the universe. Yeah, <laughs> was, I um, also gave me vibes of Peter Cushing's TARDIS. You know, it was sort of just coiled, coiled together. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that but, is um, quite deliberate in a way mm. because to me, it's a no. I couldn't say when I watched it back in 1979. I was, you know, I was just a kid really then and at that time yeah i was sort of thinking oh are these aliens real or not Mm -hmm. and i was i mean now watching it now it is so obvious that it's a fantasy and and in that first episode the clues is that the inside of the flying saucer looks like these old radios the the same old radios that he's been fixing Mm -hmm. and then the and the aliens themselves actually start repeating things that he said earlier in the day about valves and yeah technology so uh, to me it's absolutely obvious from the beginning yeah this is all the fantasy of uh this frustrated no hoper who's once who's... i've watched all of netflix and prime then i'll maybe go back and <laughs> see it again with that reading in mind so i just sort of came to it cold not knowing much at all about it which is how i, I you know i like to come to drama and or comedy for that matter and the um actually that meant that I just took it on face value and until quite late in the day because I'm crashingly naive as well. Only really by the end had I been like sort of cluing into the fact that this was not necessarily presented straight or mm. um, meant to be even, you know, even plausibly meant to be uh, a kind of a real thing that was happening to a person. Um, I think I think that didn't help because it meant everything was very muddled and incoherent up until that point. And mm. so maybe some spoilers are useful in the sense of if I'd gone in with that knowledge of mm. that reading in mind, or it, well, to be fair to myself, if the program had done a better job of selling mm. you that reading, yeah. I think, 
then mm. it could have been well, more of a kind of you know an enjoyable kind of puzzle of okay what's he fantasizing now sort of thing well i think you're in good company tim in a way in in that apparently the cast and the director weren't entirely sure if it was all the fantasy or, or if it was meant to be real that to, in fact neil blames the failure of the show partly on that neil mm. should look to the writer because <laughs> it's, it's really not well yeah. structured or, or written and um the comedy elements are or Apache at best. I do think also Hikinvig is miscast or at least misperformed mm. because mm. you need you need some way into that character. And I I, I enjoyed by and large I enjoyed Colin Jeevan's performances because mm. he had so much mm. energy and was yeah. giving it everything. And really, you know, he brought the scenes he's into life, but mm. his character is actually one dimensional, sadly. Yeah. But he's um he's definitely probably the best one the best person in it in terms mm. of acting apart from the episode with uh, the counselor's nephew yeah we he liked was, him Come yeah on. he was really good actually um we, um we were trying to remember his name I don't know if you know his name he was particularly good what I did find interesting was Tim's reaction especially in the first episode because he actually thought that Convig's wife was his mother. Yes, the way he was treated, <laughs> he was being treated. For the first couple of scenes, I think he wakes up and you know mm. she's fussing over him with a cup of tea, and um, and then it's just like, oh okay. Um, so it is again the reading of it as this a sort of bored man in a dead marriage fantasizing about beautiful space mm. aliens makes a lot more sense of all of yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. It's it's also interesting that um, the first scene is of the Martian hordes. Um, a sort of mm. callback to his uh, Quite a Master in the Pit and he uses the models a couple more times in the dream sequences so that was, as I say the dream sequences were actually some of the more interesting things mm, I agree I felt that the, yeah, the Zooks uh, <laughs> were a kind of a, <laughs> a deliberate callback to Quite a Master in the Pit I think yeah. and the those Martians. Oh, it's, it's the the name of that uh, actor who in in press, and I know because it's weird. He he's giving actually a quite a naturalistic performance mm. amongst yeah. all this yeah. desperate mugging that's going on from most of the cast. Uh, it's My Michael Maloney. No, he was he was particularly standout. Um, uh, Miss Griffin was a bit too shouty and a bit too seductive in both versions mm -hmm. but she you know she was um i'd say she was quite competent it was just uh she was overstating the sort of whole uh you know i'm berate you about everything although near the end it was interesting the way she was sort of trying to say to him you know just get out and do mm. something I think that is possibly my favorite scene in it i think that moment when they're just sitting on the landing yeah and she said, oh, why don't, yeah, as you say, she's saying, you know, why don't you just leave and take your wife mm. and dog and just go somewhere yeah. away from this, you know, horrible yeah. shop. Uh, yeah. And and you sort of wonder with Miss Griffin what her story is. We never really find out. Mm. Like you say, the trouble is she's either shouty, uh, sort of uh, aggressive woman in the shop yeah. or she's this cartoon character yeah. of the fantasy Miss Griffin. Balcony scene there, or the... Um the sort of lock fixing scene is actually probably the best it piece is. in it because you know there's a moment where you get convict you get his disappointment that he, he thinks she's about to say run away with me and, and mm. she says get your wife and go and, mm. and you know a little bit of his bubble gets burst there and it's yeah. played nicely actually yeah there's a bit of actual proper acting, acting going on <laughs> as mm. the best scene in the entire thing I think uh -huh. she's there's the reading of it where she's this uh, woman who has this incompetent repairman uh, who keeps turning up at key moments in her private life and <laughs> ruining things. Although Chaz and I were both appalled and astonished that she seemed to respond to the advances of the lustful yeah, bureaucrat. Yeah, that. But again, that's seventies and eighties, so I suppose mm. you know you sort of take it as normal. But I was really shocked that she actually what went off with him in the car. Well, that is kind of a bizarre know, scene because it's yeah. very much played that she thinks he's a creep in yeah. in, the, in the first scene and yeah. she's trying to get away from him and then, and then yeah, as you say, it's some, next minute she's ended up in a steamy car, yeah. sort of in, in the middle of I mean, the park. Yeah. It made me wonder if there's a 
there, there was a backstory to be explored there. That mm. although she seemed quite a, together, and she's you know she's an attractive young woman, you know she seems quite lonely at the same um, time. Yeah. In this, you I know, think why she put nothing in... more complicated than that they needed Kinvig to burst the bubble and yeah, ruin possibly. him in the end. So the characterization went out the window to contrive that ending. But but I would say that the other thing is maybe it's just also one of those all too familiar stories that we're hearing a lot of now where people are just sort of worn down and and mm. just you know they do it because they want to keep their job and all this nonsense mm. you know? hashtag, especially hashtag miss griffin too. yeah miss griffin too yeah. <laughs> i mean but yeah i mean 70s and 80s tv is full of that mm. you know well there's a trope as well at the kind of yeah. amorous boss and the glamorous yeah. secretary and so on so it's kind of i don't think it's explored particularly much no, no, it's sort of it's, so, it's it's glossed over very quickly I did love yeah. the, the the best of the setups. I think was the kind of denouement with the tailor's dummies, yeah, the shop was quite dummies, good. and I mean, sort of terror of the autumns all over. But mm. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> I, I did I, I, I sort of you see it coming a mile off, of course, but it's it's a very pleasing payoff when there it is in the window at the end. Mm. Um, is is the 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 likeness of the bureaucrat <laughs> in the shop in the in the shop window dummy. Um, mm. And those scenes in that warehouse were quite atmospheric. They were well shot, I think. I would say that that's actually the best episode. Mm -hmm. The humanoid factory. Um, because something there's something akin to a plot. Mm, oh, is... Because, to be honest, the whole thing just seems, we can talk about random, but, you know, <laughs> it just seems rudderless, the whole, the whole show. But, again, that could be, I mean, maybe Tony Hagar's a secret genius because his entire <laughs> life was rudderless, so the mm -hmm. whole thing is being played in that sense. Maybe Ken Big is akin to Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> We're aware of how thin the plots are because there aren't yeah. any jokes, really, to yeah. uh, distract us. I mean, it's funny, I've been watching a few of the Perry Croft uh, mm -hmm. series, and it's striking... You could actually be quite critical of them in terms of plot because a lot of their episodes just seem to stop really and leave the characters in the middle of some terrible yeah. situation. But you don't notice because it's been a really funny, yeah, you know, half hour. For uh, so you generally you don't mind that. Whereas and unfortunately in Kinpig it is laid bare. I have to go just go back. You were saying about Colin Jeevans, and I agree. Colin Jeevans on the comedy front. Yeah. He is the best in it. In the, the few times I I had I did laugh, it was tends to be a Colin Jeevans yeah sort of moment. I think probably my favourite. It might be on the first episode when he, uh, Jim comes in and sees Des fixing something amiss, and he comes in and he says, "You're working." <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and that is a rare moment of of character comedy that yeah, works it's very interesting because um the only other time he actually does anything is when he takes the key out of the lock the mm -hmm. rest of it is like he's doing you know he's doing literally nothing with his life he even meets a random guy who suddenly is going to take over his shop and he just mm. he can't be forceful enough that was to... nearly good that episode. yeah and i think the sort of duplicate plot Mm. was kind of you know had some structure to it and um get the idea coming that i i, I thought oh is it going to be a time travel thing or something <laughs> which before i'd realized that there wasn't even going to be that <laughs> you know there wasn't that reality to it um but i i did think that was that was the first one where it really had a big injection of energy at the end of the episode when mm. colin jeevens banishes the evil yorkshireman um <laughs> by throwing half the contents of the shop at him <laughs> no, it was um, it was a lot. That episode was was to say a bit more fun. I, I agree with Tim that uh, when we got to say the final three or so episodes, it was doing the bare minimum to entertain mm -hmm. at that point. And <laughs> you know, some some of it was actually quite good, but up until that, there was very little to to really recommend it unfortunately oh, and like yeah. i say you know nigel neil i mean i love his stuff i love beasts i love women mm. in black uh you know is it obviously the quatermass stuff and it just um i don't know it's a bullet i suppose you know i i would never stop a writer from you mm. know, 
mm. trying something new and oh, dipping, yeah, of course. And dipping I don't know. his toe. Give me a time machine. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think we can really have too much of a go at them because, like I say, everything else I, I think is pretty mm -hmm. solid. This is something that didn't work and really and truly, if you were to mention it to people in the context of Nigel Neal, even if people know who Nigel Neal was, you know, there's, there's not going to be that many remember it that well. Or if they do, yeah. they're just going to go, yeah, whatever. <laughs> We've got a couple of random things we observed That's to show true. In, yeah. in, in principle. It is, yeah. If it wasn't written by Nigel Neal, uh, we probably wouldn't be talking about it uh, yeah. on this podcast today. Probably yeah. not. Did we see Chunky Gilmore appear as Budder? Oh, God. <laughs> it's, you can get away with a little bit with saying, well, he's playing an alien, but the, the fact that he's gone for comedy Chinese man. Yes. Is, uh, that was a bizarre choice. <laughs> The, um, the sort of mis misspoken words thing. I, I didn't get most of those. I think because mm. partly because of the the sound quality, maybe. But the uh, it seemed to vary quite wildly actually. But sometimes mm. the volume was different even between the two halves of the same episode. But the other thing we noticed, which I was quite charmed by actually, was that at the end of the title sequence, they sort of destroy the producer's name, and that is of course what they did to John Lloyd's name at the end of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy TV series. Mm. Um, even in the very last episode, um, there's a little flying saucer comes and takes away the producer's name. <laughs> 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 I thought it was quite a nice touch, actually. Mm. I Those did quite are... like the graphical style and, and the, mm. kind of, the credits. And Those that. animated uh, credits, are, I was trying to find out who did them. I'm afraid I didn't mm. find out who did them because they struck me as very similar in style to uh, the Sapphire and Steel yes. animated yeah. opening. Yeah. And I, we know and, who did those. And, you know, I don't. I shall, I should have looked that up before yeah. uh, after Find out for your and Sapphire and Steel episode. I quite like the idea of it, the kind of vaingloriousness of it, that it starts off with this very dramatic music. It's very atmospheric. And obviously it's meant to be a contrast with, yeah. the, com with the comedy that is uh, about to come. Uh, the of it's, yeah, it's ironic, you know, because like I say, the title sequence and end titles very good, the music very good, um, and some of the effects we saw, you know, the glass shots and whatever, you know, a lot of that there was a lot of effort put into, especially for the time, and then you know it's like as i say it sort of just runs out of steam when it actually begin when the acting starts mm, it's just, yeah, i'm being so negative about it uh so yeah we have we, we should try and uh well we don't have to we we we, we gotta say it as as we see it i mean yeah i agree i think the production uh design is, mm. is quite clever some nice use of lasers in creating the sets and that's a very of its time yeah. in some ways using lasers like that we went through a phase normally on top of the pops or uh, <laughs> other variety shows uh, but i thought that was quite imaginative and, and the big house really is horrible yeah <laughs> you would not yeah. want to live in this you know you can almost smell the damp uh, it was interesting because when we were watching it you know you're sort of seeing the outside and the cars and everything and it's sort of it's always a fascinating look back when you discover uh, a sitcom or a drama from mm. that time period or earlier then how much you actually remember of it mm. you know the cars and so forth and that to me i'm i'm a very nostalgic person so it sort of did give me a sort of endorphin rush <laughs> as it were <laughs> seeing things like that that was quite fascinating but and robin uh, reliant in the back yes. your, your yeah VP. but you know um <laughs> the bits at the council actually remind me a little bit of shelley um mm -hmm. you know when he used oh, to yeah. visit the you know the the labor exchange and things you know although admittedly the the writing in that was a hell of a lot you know better mm. but it goes back to what you say about if the comedy is good a lot of the time the plot is sort of second it's not as necessary or not as important because if you're laughing all the way through it you're not really too too worried you know I mean, that, that the best Red Dwarfs, I believe, for example, are 
say, 80% comedy and 20% sci-fi. And sometimes mm-hmm. the plots are very complex and sometimes they're paper thin, but it's the comedy that moves it along. Mm, it's definitely it works. there's some great some sort of in principle there's some great material to be had but mm. it just doesn't gel does you know the ufo nut who's like the next human along from the one who actually does make contact you know it's mm. like colin jeevens his character would give his eye teeth to have what kinvig's <laughs> mm. experience and, and yeah that's, you know yeah i mean that's actually i mean that's another little moment i quite like and it's another moment where it's not trying to be funny yeah. Was, uh, when he, he gives that little speech, uh, Jim, about, uh, oh, you know, I mean, of course I believe in them, but I just I just <laughs> wish I could see one once. And, you know, it's a lovely little touching moment. Though. Absolutely. Just saying, it's sort of become a bit of a trope about the believer or the ultra believer mm. never gets to see and someone else, you know, gets to experience it. I, I mean, the other thing is I love how the conspiracy always or the the situation was always reformed to fit their narrative, you know, in mm. terms of they would always, you know, it's like that quote from Tom Baker about, you know, altering the facts to fit the situation. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. did get that quite a lot. And that was, you know, that was uh, quite a fun fun little thing uh, it was a well observed mm. like it was well written and well observed um character who or characters who would adapt the situation to fit their prior beliefs mm. but it was never funny no no and that's the shame no of it's it uh, that, that's the shame of it there is a I think, a little bit of an arc with the fantasy i think towards and again this is probably me reading too much into it because uh because in that last episode the mystery of netta where he's he's got it into his head that this encyclopedia salesman is sort of a, an enemy that uh, he needs to sabotage, and he's he's trying to slip this stuff in his drink, but of course he keeps mm. drinking it himself, which keeps sending him in his mind back to the spaceship. And it's at this point, even the people on the spaceship who up until now in every episode have been basically telling you what an amazing guy he is yeah. and how he's unique and special. I mean, some more clues there of sort of fantasy element of it that he's surrounded with people telling him how brilliant he is, and that even in and in that episode, even they're getting a bit fed up with him, and I think mm. there's a sense of could have pushed that a little bit further. I think mm. where it's all beginning to break down this. I fantasy. guess that is your moment of character crisis, yeah. such as it is. Mm. You know, he's he's had that scene with the fixing the lock and the kind of, you know, try and get away from it all. That yeah. kind of idea has come passed through him. And so this is like, yeah, they self-sabotage with the, the, the mysterious tonic, which causes mm. all these hallucinations. But that mm-hmm. that's, an, that's an interesting point, because like you say, with the self-sabotage, when your hallucinations start to turn against you, that's when your brain is starting to try to fix you as well and he's having a basically a psychotic episode so you know? season mm. two would have been just like Kinvig and Netta reading mm. through their brand new set of encyclopedias <laughs> and um, <laughs> sipping on uh, small portions of the tonic as they go and mm. kind of feeling better about themselves as people you know? yeah yeah I mean if he can share his passion with his wife it may actually mm bring him back and maybe inject a bit more interest in the marriage and so on and so forth. Also, you have the plot line in that episode that but, Netta, of course, takes an interest in it all and mm. um, tries to see what the fuss is about. Uh, I think uh, the mystery feels... of Netta is why she hasn't kicked him out months ago. <laughs> there is. I feel, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to talk, talk about Netta, who I have enormous sympathy for. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly also because even Nigel Neal, even the writer seems to have it in for her because the first few yeah. episodes, she's portrayed as this utter ninny, simple-minded mm. ninny, and you almost feel that's like that's like almost like Nigel Neal's like, well, only such, only a woman of no self-esteem at all or brains would possibly marry one of these sci-fi fans, mm. and uh, it seems a bit mean actually at first. She's portrayed in such a a negative as this this stupid woman, 
And then gradually over the series, she begins. I think she's just as frustrated as, as Des is, really. She's uh, she, she, seen she, a big so... sort of uptick and in intensification throughout yeah. the series of, yeah. of all this mm. kind of erratic behaviour and, and so on. And, you can uh, see by her facial expressions as well that, you know, it's not as we go forward, she's not necessarily sort of as happy mm-hmm. as she was in the beginning mm. or, you know, bothered. Well, there's she's that moment where he wakes up saying Miss Griffin's name over yeah. and over and she's sort and of she very... Obviously, t- barely touches on it mm. for long but you can see that moment of oh who's miss griffin and i know which one she is and, yeah you but know. you see it when they leave the shop together mm-hmm. you know that you know she starts to sort of yeah and this precludes the interest that she starts to take in his yeah, uh, hobby yeah I, I did find myself warming to the people in it mm. a little bit although i think i described it as more like stockholm syndrome <laughs> at <that point>. but, <laughs> No, you know, the, the, the sort of it's thin pickings, but mm. you can you can tease things out. To be fair, um, mm, but I yeah, think I think, that. like I say, I would be I a long time before I'd sit down. Yeah, and I it. think if he um, mm-hmm. if he did get a second series and he actually concentrated on a bit of character development, you yeah, know, he could have mm-hmm. had something. Yeah, or yeah, at least sorry. persuaded Tony Haygarth in the second series to sort of have a bit of get up and go. It might have, you know, it, it may it may well have been actually good, but I mean, th- there's only very few sitcoms from that era that are that still hold up, and I don't mean in the terms of whatever people's views are or or so mm-hmm. on. I just mean in terms of the comedy. I mean, The Good mm. Life is is a good example of something that still holds up, and I like the the previous two sitcoms that the um, director um sharp intake of breath and mm-hmm. what was the other sorry um, the other one was uh, the lovers the lovers with richard beckinsale um mm-hmm. wonderful brilliant actor and a great mm. loss really yes and very nicely observed romantic comedy that mm. one, the, the, the lovers Absolutely. Uh, you were saying about changing mores of comedy and at the risk, and so I think I, I ought to mention Netta a bit that really leapt out to me this time watching it was The Flasher, which <laughs> is very yeah. much played as a comedy prop. Mm. This Flasher, uh, and you think, yeah, this used to be a character you'd see in lots of comedy comedies, yeah. you know, aimed at the family would have the comedy what? Flasher with the long Mac, and now it just seems. Quite horrible, really. That yeah, is, and, and and when Netta and the, and that scene where Netta comes back to the shop, you know, saying oh, you know, to tell them that she's been flashed, and they just completely ignore her. That actually now that comes across as quite horrible, really, that yeah. they don't even take on her distress. It's interesting. We were talking about that, weren't we? About the the scene with the flasher, and yeah. obviously. The two are in Max, and they, mm-hmm. you know, they get kind of a tool stopped. to set them up. Yeah, yeah, mm. of course it is. But again, it's like you know, you see him, do, and it is. It's actually incredibly creepy. But it was like you say, a trope mm. in seventies, mm. eighties, whatever comedies, you know, and, and people didn't bat an eyelid. But it's actually really interesting when you go back to any old TV. The things that shock you now, mm. you know, compared to, you know, you might have watched a hundred different sitcoms that had, you know, similar elements. But it's, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's not it's not a nice moment. I think they could have probably done without it. But like I say, unfortunately, product of its time, and mm. really, I don't think anybody was thinking. Yeah. What do you think of the idea that it might have worked better as a one-off play? It would have been shorter. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Tim needs a voluntary organisation to help him get over this. (laughs) Um, I think, actually, it would have been interesting, because if you ever look at the first step toe in Sun, it's very much played as a sort of a drama where this guy is stuck in his life Mm. And you know he's he's desperate to get out. And if you look at something like Kinvig, if they'd have angled it, you know he can still have the comedy, but angled it at the fact that he was just 
desperate to get out of this mundane life. It could have been quite yeah. a, quite an interesting, you know, play. But it would it would have definitely needed, you know, tightening up and a bit more attention to the details. So you could hope for a bit more structure, perhaps. And I think the sort of thin threads that we've identified sort of maybe building up to the final episode where it sort mm. of sort of disintegrates around him as he glugs back his tonic could have yeah. um could have could have been a kind of arc to build towards in a in a kind of single longer piece of drama um yeah. i think if, if you took it over 90 minutes then yeah. all of these kind of amazing fantasies that he starts to have start to impinge more and more on the, his real life mm. netta realizes something's up and tries yeah. to help him and then I don't know if the sort of encyclopedia salesman to Newman would mm-hmm. would be kind of grand enough. But I think maybe yeah, I bringing think he... in a doctor in at the end or something, because <laughs> yeah. basically he's he. Uh, you could do the whole thing of him just slowly having a breakdown. Mm. You know, a comedy yeah. breakdown is kind of dodgy territory. Yeah, though, it? it can be, but you know, I mean, you so can got, still um, balance it. You know, uh, because, yeah, Leonard I think you Roster, would... you know, Reggie Perrin, you've got. Like, yeah. Uh, mm, very much in the kind of Reggie Perrin. I was going to say sort of Dennis Potter, but I mean, that puts it a bit more in the sort of drama, <laughs> drama sort of field. Yeah. That kind of merging of fantasy and reality. Mm. I mean, I guess Reggie Perrin's a good one to compare to, I yeah. think, in terms of somebody who's stuck in a, a, a an everyday life and starts to fantasize a bit and so on. And yeah. um, not to the same extremes as Kinvik, of course, but. It's a very good example, though, when you actually think about Reggie Perrin and you think about Kinvig, you know, they are very similar in structure. Mm -hmm. It's just, unfortunately, uh, the structure doesn't really hold together as well for for Kinvig. Reggie Perrin has got much funnier jokes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's ultimately how it lives and dies for this. It's not, it's not a funny series. Yeah, yeah, Mm. I think that's its biggest problem is that it's just not a funny show. And if it had had been funny, I was pondering if there was any. I was trying to think if there was anybody, any other writers who who have done that sort of successfully done both drama and out and out comedy. Was that guy what's his name? William something. Um Shakespeare? <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Some, yes. yeah, some bloke is scarf from the funny. Nobody yeah, recently I think. <laughs> I'm sure there are people. I, well, I would I don't know. I keep thinking of David Renwick, but mm-hmm. everything he's done has got a comedy element, element to it. I mean mm. Jonathan Greek and Love Soup are about his most dramatic, I would say, but there's still... Alan Bleach still, maybe, with GBH. Um, so, oh, I mean, it's yeah. a, a drama yeah. with some amazing moments oh, of comedy God, in yeah. it. If we can contrive yeah. to make that sci-fi, I want to talk about that. There's a Doctor Who convention actually, in one episode. Actually, yeah, so there is a Doctor Who. So, that is a, a brilliant episode. I must admit, you've mentioned the two that I would have mentioned for yeah. David Renwick. Yeah, uh, that he does one foot in the grave, mm. and he does Jonathan Creek. Although, as, as you say, Jonathan Creek is yes. on the lighter the, side. There was one called "If You See God, Tell Him," and that was a three or four part mini series with Richard Bryars, who and um, uh, Adrian Edmondson was in it as his nephew or something, and basically. Richard Bryer's character was a sort of, you know, just some old curmudgeon and he got knocked out by, a, you know, a falling of bricks. And the event, uh, when he came out of his coma, he basically had something like a 30 second memory and everything was based around adverts. So any advert he saw, he literally believed it, you know, mm. and it was it was a real satire on, you know, the the way that advertising sort of lies to you and so on. Sorry, I'm going on a lot with David <laughs> Ridley. It's in character. Yeah, but uh, that's a particularly brilliant, uh, mm. brilliant example. I'm aware of it, but I'm afraid that's one on the list to see, that one. Yeah. I remember it. Remember the time. Well, this normally this is the point where I sort of like talk about final thoughts, but I'm, I'm feeling we've kind of <laughs> expressed our final thoughts uh, pretty clearly already on on Kinvig. 
I, I could sum up by saying that I now understand for anybody who does listen to the Randomizer podcast, they will know that I've been asking Chaz to watch the mutants <laughs> for um, what seems like a long time. And now I understand his avoiding tactics and uh, yeah. the ways to get out of uh, watching we're, we're, look, we're letting out a I'm secret. Am I breaking the fourth wall? Yeah, you much, are. Right? We're letting a secret <laughs> out here. You know, I am going to watch the mutants. Wow. For the benefit of the podcast, I'm winking. Yes, he's going to watch it shortly after I rewatch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I enjoyable to find some threads through it. I, mm. Not not something that was fun to watch in itself, but you know, it's it's more sci-fi in the world, and it's kind of a you know a, definitely a, another side of a, a writer whose work I'd, mm. uh, I'd enjoyed in the past. And you kind of just think, yeah, comedy was not his metier. I I enjoyed the process of rewatching it mainly because uh, because we do randomizer we we started rewatching a lot of things and this was one that would never have been on the radar uh, you know uh, mm-hmm. and was only done for this particular podcast but I'm really enjoying especially Tim because you've not necessarily seen as much of the older stuff as say no. i have and it's always interesting to hear his opinion you know i mean okay mm. as i say this wasn't particularly a good one but it's interesting when we watch tomorrow people because we obviously were going through you know uh, nonsense episodes but mm. there are good ones and it'll be interesting to sort of you know to sort of see how you know your uh, your thing changes. Well, that, that is my other final thought. Actually, is that it's really made me appreciate the tomorrow people. A lot more. <laughs> <laughs> my work here is done. But I think actually seriously though, it, the tomorrow people is very very funny, but mm. didn't set out to be. And no. Tin Vig is not, but yeah. did. So that's the kind of difference, yeah. you know. There's um there's the so bad it's good with a lot of the tomorrow people. But I, you know, <laughs> but again, with your format, picking things that are obscure is an interesting sort of way to go because, obviously, very few people are talking about the tripods, the unbited, the knights of god, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I actually don't think there is possibly a convict podcast anywhere i would be very surprised if anybody's <laughs> been talking about it but in a way that makes it interesting you know because it's mm-hmm. it's something you know it's something new so i think it's the dirty secret of the nigel neil universe yeah it, it's sort of like um when they used to say that uh pot noodle was the slag of all snacks you know, it's like a doggy <laughs> pot noodle. Is, is this, for Nigel Neil fans, is this now Dimensions in Time? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your perseverance in, in watching Kinvig and rediscovering it. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed talking about it. I have. Much very more than I enjoyed watching much. it. it must be <laughs> very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And it's so nice to see you again. We've, uh, we've lost contact for too long. So, Far uh, too long. This has been great. Like Kinvig reunite us. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> of course, as Tim said earlier, you know, as soon as we uh, get on our next recording, uh, you're uh, you're very welcome to join us. Thank you very much. I am really looking forward to that. So I'll just say thank you again for being such great special guests, and thank you very much for listening to us, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye bye for now. You've been listening to Very British Futures, hosted by Gareth Preston with guests Tim Reed and Charles Octoloni. Music by Chattery Art. You can listen to The Randomizer at randomizerpodcast.buzzsprout.com Follow us on Twitter at FuturesVery and find out more at garethpreston.blog Oh, right. I like this tonic for you to try, by the way, Chaz. Ah, <laughs> I thought there was something weird. You thought that was Pepsi Man? <laughs> <laughs>